Well, we've been preaching about seven habits of strong Christians. We look around and see people who are full of faith and unshaken and standing strong, and we wonder, what's, what's different? Why am I so like a tree in the wind, pushed and shoved and bent over sometimes by the pressures of the world? Every Christian is as spiritual as they have chosen to be. It is a choice to give up some of the world and embrace more of the Lord. It's up to us to release the comfort zone and to get into the uncomfortable zone of faith. It will be rewarded. It will multiply. But more than that, it will strengthen you. This is our third week in this. And we have said that the secret to Christian living is in your daily routine. What you do on a daily basis. What are you willing to give up during the day to do something the Lord wants you to do? Is Bible study too hard for you? Is prayer too tough for you? Do you not have time for sharing the word? You see, we choose. We've said many, many times in this church that every person in the world can usually find the money to do something that they really, really want to do. Now, I, I mean, not to the extreme, you know. Some of us would love to live at Disneyland, and that may be a little out of our price range, you know. But within range, we can all find the time and the money to do exactly what it is that we want to do. My question is, how spiritual do you want to be? To part of your daily routine. Look at Galatians 6 with me. This is one of our foundation verses, and we'll look at it again, and then we'll jump into our new study. But Galatians, the sixth chapter, the seventh verse. Do not be deceived. You can't fool God. Don't fool yourself. You ain't fooling God. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. What you do in your daily routine will bring about the fruit of what you want. Amen? Amen. Verse 8 says, For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And that doesn't mean heaven. That means here you will be experiencing the eternal life and its benefits and its glories here. Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. I'm not going to preach on it. You can go back to the previous two. Proverbs 8. Blessed is the man who listens to me, the Lord says, watching daily at my gates, waiting at my doorposts. For he who finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. The Lord says, blessed is the one who sits by, from by my gate on a daily basis and walks and talks with me. We talked about this on Wednesday night about walking in the cool of the day with God. Do you know that that's still his desire for you today? It was not just Adam and Eve. It is for the desire of his creation. But if you don't make time in your daily routine for God, guess who gets left out? Guess who gets left out? So the secret to strong Christian living is we have a decision to make. How important is victory to you? Living in Christ is going to bring more victory in your life. Do you like the mediocre? Do you like the sometime win, sometime lose? Or do you want victory? An athlete will get victory if they work at it. It's not going to come because of intention. It's not going to come because they want it to. So we said that the first good habit that Christians have is to feed their spirit. And we talked about that. I'm not going to reteach that. And also they build their faith. What does that mean? Okay, They build their faith. The third thing that we're going to talk about then is strong Christians speak the Word of God. Now, how many of you know you can't speak it if you don't 
know it. Can you imagine being an actor and having a part on the stage and never cracking the play open and learning your lines? How would that be on stage if you never learned your lines? But those of us that have been in drama before, we can hear a line and remember what our lines were 50 years ago. I can remember some of the plays I did in college and high school. I can, I can see a movie or something like that of Mr. Roberts and I was Ensign Pulver in high school, okay? Yeah, I was a Jack Lemmon part in that, in that play. And I can hear that and still get run lines. Because I had to learn it. How many of you know that the Jews knew the word of God? So when Jesus spoke, they knew exactly what he was talking about. What we call mysteries of the kingdom and the mysterious words of Jesus were no mystery to the Jews because they knew exactly what he was talking about. Well, isn't it a shame that what we should know we call mysteries? What we should know by heart, God has given to us because we speak the word. Look at Proverbs 18 with me. Proverbs 18, 20 and 21. With the fruit of a man's mouth, his stomach will be satisfied. With the fruit of a man's mouth, what you say will satisfy your interior. Okay? <clears throat> he will be satisfied with the product of his lips. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruit. You have what you say you have when it comes to the Bible. The fruit is in our words. God has given us power and authority. <clears throat> In the garden, Adam and Eve were given dominion over all the earth. They traded it away for a fruit salad. All right? They traded it away for a little fruit salad. Now, my wife's fruit salad is enough to be tempting for that, but pretty good fruit salad. But I'm here to tell you that when they gave up the garden, they gave up the dominion of the earth. And with that dominion, then the devil said, thank you very much. I'll swap you this fruit salad for the control that you have. But I'm here to tell you that at the cross and at the tomb, the empty tomb, we got it back. We are restored. And we got the power and the authority back. Jesus said, all authority and power has been given to me and I give it unto you. Now go into all the world. If that ain't you and me, who is it? If that's not you and me, who was he talking to? Now the question is, what are we the church doing with that authority and power? Now I know that there are people in Tulsa who have created vast empires and dynasties who have misused this passage. And they've got a name it, claim it idea that if they say it, God's obligated to do it. And while we've got my neck, my foot on God's neck and saying, Do it! You said you would! Do it! You said you would! Do it! You promised me! That's not the God I know. The only one that I put my foot on the neck of is the devil. My God is still sovereign and he will do what he wants to do. But that does not mean that I do not walk in authority and power. And I do that which, which he tells me to do. And if he backs it up, amen. And if he chooses not to, he is my God and I will worship him and I will praise him. But it doesn't keep me from doing what I'm supposed to do. We don't throw out the baby with the bathwater, we say. Just because I use power and authority of my word and it doesn't come about as I think it was does not mean that God was not in control. It just means my faith says, keep doing it. A lack of faith says, I didn't see it, I can't do it. Faith says, he said it, I'm going to do it. Look at Genesis, the entire first chapter there almost. <laughs> 1, 3, 6, 9, 11, 14, 20, 24, and 26. Starting with that third verse. 
Then God said, verse 6, Then God said, verse 9, Then God said, verse 11, Then God said, verse 14, then God said. Are you getting the feeling that there might be power and authority in the spoken word? God didn't think it. He said it. He said it. Verse 20. Then God said. 24. Then God said. 26. Then God said. The authority and power that God had in the creation of the world, Jesus said, he's given to me, and so I spoke to the demons and they fled. I speak to the illness and it crumbled before my feet. I speak to the lost and I forgive their sins and their sins are forgiven. And that power and authority I give to you. God said, God said, God said, God said. Look at Matthew 4, 1. Matthew 4, 1 through 11. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. After he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. I think I would have too. How about y'all? Okay. And the tempter came and said, Would you like some fruit salad? I have some left over from the garden. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. And he answered and said, It is written. Verse 5. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it's written, He will command his angels concerning you on their hands. They will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him. You see, the devil took uh, scripture out of context and misquoted it. And Jesus straightened out his wagon. He picked up his wagon and put it in a straight rut, in a straight path. Every time that he tried to per, uh, pervert it, Jesus fixed it. How many of you know then that Jesus probably knew the Bible pretty well? You say, it's his book, he wrote it. Yeah, but he gave it to you to learn. What have you done about it? What have you, I mean, come on, how old are you? How long you've been in the kingdom? How long you've been born again? How long you've been saved? How long you've been hanging out in church? And how much do you really know about what it says? Do you really care? Do you really give a rip? Do you really? Or are you just playing picnic till he comes? How important is victory to you? Our country is going to hell in a handbasket and we're watching Facebook and video games and Candy Crush and Angry Birds. Those are games that some of the older folks play, young people. We're playing the old people games when our world is going to hell in a handbasket and our grandparents knew the word and we marvel that they did. But we haven't taken the time to. The temptation. We know the story. Every time the devil spoke, Jesus fixed the scripture. If it was important enough for him, you think it might be important enough for us? If the one example that God gives us of how to defeat the devil is to quote scripture back to him, then how important has it been to you in your Christianity? How big of a priority has it been? Or has it been one of those things that we're always going to get around to but never do? How many of you have ever gotten one of those little wooden things that says round to it? 
So it looks it looks like a wooden nickel, but it says T U I T on it, stamped T U I T. And you say, what's that? Well, that's a round to it. When you get around to it, do it. When I get around to it, I'm going to do it. Well, not then do it. Here, here you go. I'm giving you a round to it. A lot of things we're going to get are two when we get around to it. How many of you know that as seniors, a lot of us have been given extra time to be with God? And we spend more time in our 30s than we have in our 80s and our 70s. Back when we had kids, we were praying all the time. How many of you know some of our kids aren't any better off than they were back then? And we don't pray like we used to. We're not in the Word like we used to. We have become worry, weary and well-doing. Genesis 1.26, let's go back. Remember on the previous slide, God said, God said and God did. Amen? Then Genesis 1.26, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Now here's the sad part. He was talking about the devil there. Not too much more creepy than the devil. We were supposed to have dominion over him, but we gave in. And that's why the Lord took his legs away. That was something we were supposed to have authority over. But we traded our authority. And God took his legs. And he creeps on the earth. Yet today. God gave us the authority over this planet. And if God said it, we need to be doing it. I like to call this verse the God said, we say. God said, we say. If God said it, then I can say it. Because I am his ambassador. We say, we are the hands and feet of God on earth. Until Jesus comes back. We are the hands and feet of Jesus. We feed the sick. We take care of the poor. We love the unlovely. But a part of being the hands and feet is being the mouth of Jesus and speaking the power and the authority. If you read the message given on Pentecost by Peter. This just popped into my head. Sorry. i got to get my thoughts straight. If you read the message of Pentecost and Peter and the most important first message of the church, there's not one word there about feeding the poor. There's not one word about loving the unlovely. There's not one word about an ecumenical movement that will make us all one. It is go and spread the gospel that he has died, he has been buried, and he has been resurrected. And all that the books of the Old Testament have said have pointed to that which you have witnessed in this city. That was the most important thing that God wanted the church to speak and do. It was the first message of the church. And somehow we've perverted it to think that if we do good things, we're doing God's will. What good does it do a full belly to die and go to hell? What does it do to love somebody here and let them die and go to hell in their sin? That's not love. That's convenience. That's not rocking the boat. Don't talk about homosexuality. That might make somebody mad. Let them get mad. Love them in it. Love them in it. Don't judge them in it. Love them in it, but love them to righteousness. It's not my job to make everybody happy. It's my job to get everybody born again. And as a preacher, as I've said before, my job is to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. So God says, we say. Look at Matthew 21.
Every year at the first of the year, I pray, Lord, let us be stronger this year than we were last year in you. If you're not deeper in your commitment and walk with the Lord this year than it was last year, it's not his fault. Because his desire is for you to grow daily, let alone annually. All right, so Matthew 21, 18 and 19. Now in the morning when he was returning to the city, he became hungry. Seeing a lone fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it except leaves only. I'm hungry and there's no fruit. And he said to it, no longer shall you ever Shall there ever be any fruit from you? And at once the fig tree withered. I've told you we have a neighbor with a cottonwood tree, and Carol and I pray this every spring. <laughs> May that tree wither. Because its cottonwood gets all over our yard and not theirs. It doesn't fall straight down. It floats right over the fence into our pool, our pool filter, into our yard. Sometimes it looks like it's snowed. Now, it has not happened yet, but I'm going to do it again this spring. I'm not going to give up. That's right. I've got the faith that it'll happen. Because Jesus said, Jesus said, be withered, and it was. Now look at the very next verse. Seeing this, the disciples were shocked, amazed, and blown out of their saddle, and asked, how did that fig tree wither all at once? How did you do that? I mean, it was there. I can understand coming back two weeks and seeing a dead tree. But he said, wither, and it went, okay. I mean, it withered and died in front of their very eyes. Right in front of it. It just went, whoop. And it's dead in a doornail. And Jesus answered and said to them, Truly I say to you, if you have faith, and if you do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, it will happen. And all the things you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. Now again, the biggest problem with this verse is we always say, yeah, but I tried and it didn't. Yeah, but how about that time? How about that time? The secret is, sometimes God doesn't want the tree to die. And I'm not going to force him into it because of my words. But if I think it should die, and I tell it to die, and he doesn't want it to die, that's okay with me. I have the faith to believe. But it doesn't mean this spring I'm not going to talk to the cottonwood tree. <laughs> Amen? Remember the persistent woman who goes to the judge and knocks and he says even an unrighteous man will finally give up with persistence. I am just that persistent. I believe in my God just that much. And I hate that cottonwood just that much. Okay, I know God created it. But I know he makes mistakes in what he creates because I've been around people. That's a joke, okay? <laughs> of course, God doesn't make mistakes. But what does this mean? Jesus said, I said it, and I'm giving you the power and authority. So Jesus said, we say. Jesus said, we say. Jesus said, we say. Now, either you believe this verse, or you're going to pluck it out and say, I can't believe all the Bible because it didn't work for me. Didn't work for me. It did. Sometimes the answer is no. Sometimes the t answer is late. How many of you have had that prayer answered later and gone, hey, we prayed about that months ago. Remember that? We prayed about that months ago. I told you that I drove by this church on my way to go out to Waco, and I said, Lord, wouldn't it be nice if I could just, you know, buy a vocational pastor a little church just like that, about that size. That'd fit in just really, really good to our ministry right now. That'd be really, really nice. I worked at Waco for a couple of years. And then I get a phone call from the school that says, would you like to come on full time? We'd like to have you full time. And I said, you mean quit Waco? And they said, yeah, yeah, quit where you're at and come on full time. And I said, yeah, the same day, Grace Bible Church called and said, hey. Same day. 
How many days did I drive by here and say, wouldn't it be nice if I had a nice little church like that? Wouldn't it be nice? God not only gave me a nice little church like that, He gave me that church. Do you know why I stand up here every Sunday and I'm thankful that you are here? Because God gave you to me. And He gave me to you. How can I not be thankful and grateful this is the work of God in answering my prayer four years later. And now I've been here 15 years. Y'all going to have to pray real hard to get me out. <laughs> You're not praying hard enough. I'm still here, okay? So God, Jesus said it and we say it. Jesus said it and we say it. That's what it says in Matthew 21, is it not? Look at Isaiah 55, verses 10 and 11. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there without watering the earth and making it bare and sprout and furnishing seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so will my word be which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty. Just because I don't see it mean, doesn't mean God didn't get what he wanted. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire, without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. God's word and will will be done. It will be done. I can in faith pray for the sick. And if you die while I'm praying, God's will was done. And I was obedient. I have seen the sick get up off their sick bed. I have prayed for people that I thought, this is a waste of my time and effort, God. They are sick. They are miserable sick. And you finish the prayer and you turn around and look at the family and say, well, you know, God's faithful. And uh, we prayed the prayer of faith and I'm kind of apologizing for God. And the person gets up and says, you want something to eat? <laughs> you <go>, what? <laughs> you're well. Well, yeah, you prayed I would be. I know, but you're well. <laughs> are, are you kidding me? You, you got well? How's that faith believing, huh? Shows where our real heart is. When we're shocked. When he does what he says he will do. The Word of God is irresistible. It is a supernatural power. It will never return empty. You can speak it and know that it will never return empty. God's Word will accomplish. Speaking His Word equals power. It's power. Why don't we do it more? Because it changes our routine. Jeremiah 23, 23, 28, and 29. The prophet who has a dream may relate his dream, but let him who has my word speak my word in truth. What does straw have in common with grain, declares the Lord? It's apples and oranges. When I speak it, it's power. Don't, don't mess with it. 29 says, Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer which shatters a rock? Many times we speak the word of God and pray the word of God as though it was a piece of velvet and we're going to whack something to death with cloth. Break rock. I don't even see a crack. Break rock. My faith is a little weak because his word is not limp. His worth is a hammer. Satan, be gone. Hammer. Ouch. It's a hammer. It's a fire. It's authority. It's power. 
we're out of time. We're going to stop there. We're going to stop there and we'll finish next week on strength number three. But do you get the idea? Do you have to wait till next week to start doing it? No. Think you got enough information to get started tomorrow? How about this afternoon? Yeah. How about now? It is our power and authority that has been given to us. The question is, what are we doing with it? Strong Christians speak the word. Strong Christians have to know the word, and that's what the first two, first two were about, wasn't it? First two was about the word. Is it any wonder that the first two would prepare us for the word, and the third one would let us use the word? Seven habits of a strong Christian. I've not given you anything yet that's going to hurt you physically, emotionally, or spiritually. You're not going to get a sprain of anything by doing what God asks you to do. But you may have to change your daily routine. You may have to do something different to get from here to there. Let's stand together.